them with us this morning. You'll get to hear them a little bit later as well. So thank you, Cindy, for bringing your friends along this morning so we can enjoy that. So I invite you and to stand as we say our call to worship this morning and prepare our hearts and our minds to worship the Lord together. All right, we're just waiting for these slides. We come to you, O oh God, to thank you for what is good. We come, we come to you, O oh God, to cry out, out for, for what, what is wrong. We come to you, O oh God, to ask for help and restoration. We come, we come to you, O oh God, with aching hearts and, and glad souls. souls. Let, Let us worship God. God.
forgive us for teaching us and for loving us. You are our all in all, all. May we live each day in the knowledge and consolation of your presence. And thank you for working in our lives. Amen. Jesus is our strength. He gets us through the days, right? Well, we're, now it's time for the kids' message, so we welcome all the kids. Come on down front with us here. Join us on the steps. We welcome all the kids who are here in person and all of you who are online. And we have a guest assistant today with our kids' message. And come on, slide over all this way, kids. Come on on both sides. We have Miss Sharon. Justin's mom is going to help us with the treasure box. Let's welcome her, helping us treasure box. So Pastor Dave is teaching about spiritual warfare, and Michael's been battling a headache all weekend, so he's not here today, but we're going to lift him up in prayer because we know the power of prayer. But we're praying for you, Michael, and we miss you. But we welcome all the kids here, and we're so glad you're here, and thank you, Miss Sharon, for helping us out today. Well, let's see what's in. Oh, we're going to talk about the kids' message is the armor of God, right? The armor. What is armor? We talked about it before. Joanne. Something that protects you, yes. When do you need armor? Justin. In fights or fights against evil and heaven. Yes, during fights. In fights against evil and in heaven? Yes. Evil and 
Yes, it's evil versus good, right? So we put the armor on to protect us against what's evil. Very good. Well, you know, the soldiers wear it and warriors wear it when they go into battle, right? It's the protection. Yes, Johan. How can they fight? How do they fight their bodies? Yeah, how do they fight with their bodies in all that armor? How do they actually fight? That's a good question. Anybody ever have to fight with armor on? (laughs) Yes, they have to be real strong. Thank you, Mark. And they, they build up their bodies to be able to carry all that armor. Well, let's look at what's in God's treasure box for today. We're going to have Justin come on up next to his mom. He's going to help out. So why don't you stand on that side, the other side of your mom over there, okay? All right, let's see what's in here. Okay, what is this? Armor. Yes, what part of the armor is that? That's the helmet. Anybody wear a helmet when you go bicycle riding or skateboarding or anything? Who wears helmets? Helmets are good, right? Oh, and here we got, I don't know if that's going to fit them, but let's try that belt. There you go. That's a belt. All righty, look at that. Thank you, Justin, for wearing the armor. That's a shield that goes on your arm, right? There's a shield. Oh, this is going to be harder to put on here, but try to put these over his ankles. Let's see. Ankles? Well, it's kind of like over your feet. We're just going to wrap these around. You see, look at how much long it takes to put on armor. Can you imagine in the old days when they had to wear their armor, how long it took to get ready for battle? So God wants us to be prepared for battles, right? Just like we have to take time to put on our armor. All right, let's see what else. Oh, and that goes actually right down by the ankles. Ooh. Those are because those are the shoes, right? We got to protect our feet, even. We got to protect every part of us. Here, Justin, this can go on your arm. Oh, it doesn't fit? Okay, that's okay. We'll just pretend that those are on there. We'll put them down on the floor there. And let's see, let's hold that one. You got a sword. Now, oh, and here's your shield. Let's put that, your arm through there. Look at that. How does he look? Does he look like he's ready for battle? Yeah. Yeah. He's ready for battle, right? Well, he's wearing all these different pieces, right? You need every piece of armor to have the full protection. Would you go into battle without your helmet on? No. No. Would you go in without your sword? No. What if you were just like running like this on your armor and you had nothing to fight with, right? So you have to wear all the parts of the armor, right? Well, let's see. God says he gives us special armor, right? So we're going to look in here. And let's see. I need, let me see. I'm going to have Minchan. Come on up over here next to Justin. And where's Lisa? Lisa knows the parts of the armor. Come on over here. And let's see. Okay, come on up here. I forget your first name. I just lost. Oh, Sophia. Come on up, Sophia. Okay, so what I want you kids to do, Sophia, if you can lead them, go ahead and put, you know, do you know the parts of the armor? Together, I want you to tape the parts of armor onto Justin's pieces of armor. Here we go. I'm going to give you the first one is the belt of what? Who knows what the belt is? Truth. You got truth. That's the first word on there. Go ahead and tape truth to that. Okay, how about the breastplate? The breastplate of what? Everybody can say it. Righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness. Go ahead and tape that on there. How about the shoes? What do the shoes bring? Peace. Yes, the gospel of peace. Thank you. And then we have a shield. What's the shield for? The shield of? Everybody say it together. The shield of faith. Yes, we have the shield of faith. Here we go. We're going to learn all these together, it looks like. Okay, and the helmet. What's the helmet? The helmet of? Salvation. salvation. Thank you, Pastor Dave. Okay, he's been preaching about this. Okay, let's put salvation on his head. The helmet of salvation. Oh, good job there. Okay, and then the sword of the? What's the sword? Oh, on the chest. Yeah, here you go, Lisa. Here's some tape for you. And the sword of the what? <clears throat> The sword of the Spirit, which is the what? The word of? Yes, now look at this. Now these are God's. Do we need any more tape? Look at that. Wow, this looks wonderful. Okay, here's a couple more pieces. The sword uh, goes right. That's the word of God. Let's tape that to the sword. And the sword of the Spirit is the word of God. So we want to think about this, right? The belt of truth that holds everything together. God's truth holds all the pieces together. The breastplate of righteousness, right? It protects our hearts, right? We have to do what's right in God's eyes. We want to have that, wear that breastplate of righteousness. You got everything on? You need another piece of tape? Here's another tape for the spirit. The sword of the spirit. That can go on the other side of the sword. All righty. This looks great. 
The shoes of the gospel of peace, you know, our feet carry us where we go. So we, we want to bring peace wherever we go, right? And we want to bring the good news about Jesus wherever we go. The shield of faith. Hold up your shield there, Justin. Let's see. That shield of faith, right? We have to have faith in God, faith in Jesus, and faith in the Holy Spirit. And it says that that will extinguish all those flaming arrows that the evil one, that the devil tries to throw at us. The helmet of salvation. I remember one time I was praying, I asked God, why is the helmet, why is salvation the helmet? He said it protects our minds and how we think. We have to choose to follow God, right? Salvation is a choice that we all make following Jesus. What else do we have? The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. It is the most powerful thing, right? It teaches us what's right from wrong. Here, I'm going to pass this out. This is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, the Bible. And Jesus guides us and teaches us how to follow him, how to put on the armor, right? And that one more thing, there's one more piece of paper in there that doesn't have something. Can you hold that up? What's that say, Sophia? Prayer. Prayer. You know that sometimes we leave that one out of the armor, but that is a part of the armor. Our prayers are powerful, and it says that we're supposed to pray in the Spirit on all occasions. And one thing we want to remember is that we are never alone in battle because God is always with us, and he's fighting the battles for us. Okay, understand that. What are the parts of the armor? We're going to go together. Ready? What's this? Helmet of? What's this? Belt of? Breastplate of? Shoes of the? Gospel of peace. Oh, sorry, this is the righteousness. Shoes of the gospel of peace. What's this? The shield of? Yes, and the sword of the? Right, the sword of spirits, the word of God. Yes, we're going to talk about all that later. But right now, I'm going to ask, um, let's see. I haven't asked yet, but maybe, Juhan, can you come and pray for us, please? Come on. You want to pray? No, who, who wants to pray for us this morning? Okay, come on up. Yeah, yeah, come on, Johan, you can pray. Ready? Yeah, you can do it. Okay, ready? Nice and close. Dear God, you are the one truth, true God. You are all powerful and all loving. Nothing is possible, impossible with you. Thank you for giving us your armor and for showing us how to fight the enemy's attacks. Thank you that you never leave us and thank you for fighting the battles for us. God, help us stand firm, firm, firm to be strong, even when it's hard to help us to put on every piece of your armor. Help us to do what's right in your eyes. Help us to believe in Jesus and help us to read the Bible every day. Help us to pray in the spirit all the time. Show us how to love your more and tell how to tell love each other. Bring healing to your children to you are not feeling feeling well. Bless all of your children and your church here and around the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Great job. Thank you, Johan. And thank you, Justin and Miss Sharon, for helping us out with this lesson. Now, let's go talk about the armor of God, kids. All right, let's put, let's put. Good morning. Are we working? To, hello? Testing? Okay, now we're ready. <laughs> Good to see James back again. And Josiah's back there helping too. Thanks. All right. Welcome to Union Church. We're glad you're here and uh, with us this morning worshiping. Uh, the lights are still working. Pastor Dave can still preach another 14,997 sermons until they burn out. So, keep going. All right, the connect uh, with us. That's this card right here. You'll find it in your pews. There's two sides. You can fill it out. And uh, if you don't have time to fill it out before the offering, you can always bring it back to, you know, leave it somewhere else uh, close by, and somebody will find it, hopefully. 
And uh, the card lets us know that you are here. And uh, you can also submit prayer requests and uh, a few other things, the weekly highlights. I just uh, was supposed to announce about uh, the big Sunday, and then I looked on my email, and it said it's been postponed. So that's one of the things you find out when you're signed up for the email blast. So big Sunday, the update is due to a small number of people being available to help us with this event. It's been postponed to a date later in the summer. I don't know if it's June 40th or something. I'm not sure exactly. We'll keep you informed on the next new date and plans that become available. If you're interested in helping with this event, please let us know so we can include you in the planning process. Okay, Vacation Bible School. I think it's actually a night school because it runs on June 13th through 17th at 6 p.m. to 8.30. And the English program is uh, for first through fifth graders. And the younger program will be in Korean only. So today's last day to register uh, for VBS. And you can email uh, children underscore youth at unionpc.org to receive registration and waiver forms. VBS is a wonderful summer camp. Program is biblically based and fun for kids. Invite friends and neighbors too. How many of you have been to a vacation Bible school? Raise your hand. I remember when I was in third grade, we made something. I was like some coasters and stuff, and I still have them. So it's kind of cool. Nowadays, I think they do a lot of stuff in paper, but uh, back in the old days, they actually had some cool stuff. They probably still have good stuff. Uh, okay, praise and prayer. Uh, you're invited to join Union Praise and Prayer Group. With so many things going on in the world, we want to stand together in faith and would love to have more people participate in intercessory prayer at our church. We meet weekly on Thursday from 11.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. That's only an hour. Currently meeting only on Zoom. To receive the Zoom details or to send in praise or prayer request, email prayer at unionpc.org. Let's pray together over our church, our community, our country, and our world. Okay, please join me in our uh, Bible memory verse. It's from Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 5. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Okay, now it's time for our offering. As part of our worship, we continue to give back to God out of the blessing he has given us. During the offering music, we invite the ushers to come forward to pass the plates, collect the offering, and connection cards. Hopefully you had all filled out already. Other ways to give include mailing your check to the church, or you may give online at unionpc.org slash give. And we're blessed to be able to give 22% of our general giving to support local and worldwide missionaries.
The reason that music sounds a little bit different is that it's Celtic music, yes? So as opposed to being like Mozart or Brahms or something like that. So that's why it sounds a little bit um, different than you might have been expecting. So that's why. Um, let me pray for us. Lord, thank you for... Um, yeah, thank you for today, the gift of today, um, and the gift to be able to be a blessing to other people in this world. We ask your, your blessing on the money that's been collected, that it would be a blessing to the world, uh, to people who need it. Um, we ask for ourselves, Lord, that we also would be a blessing to the world, that we would see ourselves and understand ourselves as being sent into the world that, that needs to hear that you love them. Um, we pray for our world that seems so full of pain and, and division. Um, I think of Ukraine, of course, uh, Lord, that, that we ask that um, Christians would <coughs> make you known in that scary place right now, but also in, in our country where there are lots of shootings, some of them race-related. Lord, bring peace and, and justice to this, to this world. Um, starting with me and, and with us. Um, thank you that you are God who loves us, who calls us higher and better than, than we think we can be. Lord, use our lives always to bring you glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Old Testament reading today comes from Psalm 37, verses 1 to 17. Do not fret because of the wicked. Do not be envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Live in the land and enjoy security. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your ways to the Lord and trust in him and he will act. He will make your vindication shine like the light and justice of your cause like the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret over those who prosper in their way, over those who carry out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil. For the wicked shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. Yet a little while, and the wicked will be no more. Though you look diligently for their place, they will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant prosperity. The wicked plot against the righteous and gnash their teeth at them, but the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he sees that their day is coming. The wicked draw the sword and bend their bows to bring down the poor and needy, to kill those who walk uprightly. Their sword shall enter their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. Better is a little that the righteous person has than the abundance of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous." Okay, so this is our last sermon on spiritual warfare until the next one. And with nearly 15,000 sermons to get to, <clears throat> apparently, I get, I, apparently I better get started. You know, the devil has um, a couple ways that we experience his power. The first is through temptation. And temptation generally is taking something good that God has created and twisting it. So, for example, we take the good that, of sex that God created between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, and, and that, that gets twisted into abuse and into prostitution and, and into pornography. See, the devil cannot create. He can only twist. The other power that he has is the power of accusation. It's the idea that... <coughs> <coughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> I've still got a cough from COVID. So keep praying for me. <clears throat> it's the idea that the devil has um, planted a microphone on all of us, or a little video. And so when the time comes, he will press play on that video, and, and, it, and our lives will play out before the court. Everything that we've done wrong, everything that we've said wrong, all that visual proof, and the devil hopes that will be the end of us. You know, there is power in making an accusation. There is power in taking something hidden and bringing it to light. That doesn't make it right always. It doesn't mark someone who does that necessarily as a do-gooder, but you can see that there's power there. I mean, it's why people write books after a presidency. 
Those accusations sell books. It's why we're fascinated with crime dramas. Much of the power of the devil <coughs> is through his accusations against us. <coughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> so our passage today. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and, having, and after having you have done everything, to stand. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your word. I ask, Lord, that you would help us to hear the implications of it and to live in the, in the light of your grace and love and acceptance always. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to start off a little bit about where we dropped off last week. Last week I touched on this word schemes in there, against the devil's schemes. In Greek, it's actually the word where we get the word method from or methodical. Um, it's, it's a strategy. It's, it's a long game, a well-thought-out plan in order to get something to happen. A scheme is not a bad translation, except that when I think of a scheme, the person that comes to mind, there was a guy in my church in Long Island, and he um, was not okay mentally, and I think he would agree with that assessment. He would, would be institutionalized from time to time. But he came to me one idea, one day with a scheme. Um, it was, he was trying to be helpful. And so he said, I have this idea to, to a ministry to the homeless in our area. And what it is, is we can build igloos on the church property for the homeless out of meat. And so whenever the homeless get hungry, they can shave off a little bit of the meat and fry it up and, and they won't be hungry anymore. And I said, gosh, that really sounds like a ministry more to the dogs um, around here. Um, I, I said no relatively quickly to that idea. But that's, to me, what a scheme is. It's a quick way to accomplish something, to make money or to get a car. Uh, a scheme sounds like something that's either just barely legal or shouldn't be legal. That's not the idea in the text. The idea here is that the devil is laying traps for us. <clears throat> and has been for years. So I want us to be clear on who we're up against. The devil is a liar. He is a twister, and he always has been. I'm actually not worried about the occult. I know lots of people like horror movies and thinking about that kind of stuff, but there's really only been a, ever a small percentage of folks that, that thought that the, the devil will give them power in this life. And I'm just not into horror movies I just don't think it's real. It's not something that we need to worry about. What we need to worry about more so is the lies that we have bought into about who we are and who God is and, and what our relationship should be like with God. See, I think the devil is much more subtle these days than, than perhaps he used to be. You know, people back in Jesus' days seemed to be very, very clear when someone had, had a demon, where... <coughs> Whereas we would say someone has a permanent bad attitude or is always super aggressive or super narcissistic or something like that. So in some ways, getting us to think that the devil is into the fantastic, into this amazing evil, is really a, just a distraction. There's no need to torment somebody with the fantastic evil if just a few subtle lies can put someone on the wrong path, going the wrong direction in life. And I think the older generations of mature Christians understood that. There are some great books written about the devil's schemes from the Reformation time, so 1500s, post-Reformation, 1600s, 1700s. And, and they talk very little about the extraordinary, about, about demonic influences, but they, they talk about the lies. They talk about it the way I want to talk about it. So they'll say, okay, here are the ways that the devil gets his lies into your system based on who you are. So you'll get a, a big, thick book, and, and it'll, it'll, uh, it'll say, the devil tempts us. And here are the 18 ways that the devil tempts us. Here's how to recognize what's going on, and, and here's what to do when you recognize what's happening. 
And so here are the 25 ways in which the devil tries to discourage and depress us. And, and here's what to do when you recognize this is going on and how to deal with it. Very detailed, very practical. The older generations of, of Christians, when they thought about the devil, they thought about his lies. They, the way the devil distorts our ways of believing. The normal process of a demonic attack is to distort our belief system so that we get confused at what's going on. You know, in, in counseling, <coughs> one of the, the no-goes in counseling is you really can't talk about a person's core beliefs. You have to avoid that. But really, sometimes it's necessary because our problems often come from our core beliefs and our core belief system, but, uh, but counselors are prevented from doing that oftentimes. So let me give you an example. So a person is depressed because of an issue because of the way that they're looking at their life and what they believe about themselves. I'll give you an example. A person says to two different people, I know who you are, this is what you are, this is what you're like, and, and um, you're this and you're that. And the first person might just kind of shrug their shoulders and go, well, actually, I'm, I'm, you've got me wrong. I'm not those things. Because they're not listening to the lies in their core. But the second person might get really depressed because they buy into what that person has said. <coughs> that they are this and they are that. <coughs> they believe the lie that was told about them and then there's this negative reaction of like depression. One of my core verses for this whole passage, this whole series has been 2 Timothy 2.25 where Paul gets at this. He says, God grant that they may repent and know the truth and escape the snare of the devil. I mean, that to me is the key verse on how to deal with the devil. You have to know the truth and have it at the core of who you are, that we are God's child and he loves us. And that will protect us from a lot of harm over the long run. And then we repent and get a hold of the truth and the truth will set us free. Here's the thing. There are lies that the devil tries to plant deep in your soul. It could be words from our culture or from our friends or from our enemies or from our parents, but they're stuck in our psyche deep down there, waiting to cause us harm. Now, I don't know how much the devil knows about each one of us, but there are common lies that we buy into. And if they're spread widely enough, the devil can try his stick on, on a whole society. A percentage will believe that lie. And then we're off in a different direction. So Ephesians 4.27 says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't give the devil that kind of a foothold. And because we haven't forgiven then, we get bitter because we believe what this person has really said about us or, or done against us and how this person has ruined our lives. But really, it's our fault because we gave the devil a foothold by not forgiving, and now that incident is being used against us. Or we can look at 1 Timothy 3, <coughs> 6 through 7. And he's talking here about bishops and the qualifications for bishops. So he said, Paul says to Timothy, he must not be a recent convert, the, the bishop, or he may be puffed up with conceit and fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace and the snare of the devil. So that then is the example of pride as opposed to for forgiveness. See, our false beliefs about ourselves are, are potential footholds for the devil. I mean, what do you do? You repent and you see the truth and you move forward. And you say, why am I so bitter against this person? What's going on here? We have to see the truth that we believe so that person has taken something from us, besmirched us in somehow, somehow and, and they've taken something from us that we need in order to survive and be happy. My friend says it's like there's a piano in our heads. And every so often there's an invisible guy who sneaks in and starts playing it. And then all these thoughts start bubbling up. We get indignant as as to what's happened to us in the past. We get bitter, and then what? Well, we have to repent, and we have to see the truth, and get, we have to get rid of the piano. Forgiveness is one of those things that gets rid of the piano. So is getting rid of your pride. So the first set of lies I want to talk about are <coughs> accusation. The devil tempts, and then he accuses. And they're complementary lies, the, ac the, the temptations and the accusations. So the temptation is for us to take sin too lightly. To, I don't know if you've ever heard when you're thinking about doing something, you hear this voice go, ah, it's not so bad. Everybody does it. 
You can repent later. It's not a big deal. And so those are the lies that get us into temptation, taking sin too lightly, and it's complemented later by accusation, which is taking sin too seriously. So here's how it looks. You're tempted to do something, right, or say something, and you hear, it's not that bad. Everyone's doing it. You can repent later. People say that stuff all the time. You can get, it's easier to, to get forgiveness than permission, um, you know, and that's going into the sin. And then you do the sin, and you're coming out of it, and you get hit with the accusations. Who would forgive you after you did that, after you said that? Your life is over. You call yourself a follower of Jesus, and you did that? Wow. Just wow. I mean, these two work together like a, a two-punch combo in boxing. You know, it's, it's often your, your offhand. I'm, I'm right-handed, so you set up the right hand, with, with the left hand, right? So the left hand is the little jab. That's the temptation. And then you pop and then get smacked with the accusation. That's the big one. Satan tries to get us into sinful situations in order to keep us from experiencing God's grace. He wants us to forget or perhaps never understand that we are accepted by Christ. We are righteous in him no matter what. But we have a tendency to forget that when we're in sin. So then let's talk about accusation. Satan, the word Satan actually means accuser or prosecutor. Here's the thing. You're not supposed to just be loved, forgiven, and accepted by God. You're supposed to know that as well. You're supposed to live in it. So let me ask you a question. There's a, a poor person who has $10 million dollars dropped without them knowing it into their bank account, probably from a Nigerian prince, right? <laughs> are they wealthy or are they not wealthy? Well, that's debatable, right? It's, they're, they're rich legally, but not practically because they don't know it's there and they never use the money. In a similar way, it's one thing for a follower of Jesus to be saved, accepted by God, and loved by God completely. But it's two different things. It's, it's one place to be in that there legally, and it's another complete different thing to be living out of that grace and that love, to be writing checks, as it were, on the money that's in the bank. So if we really are forgiven, one of the results is <coughs> that we're fearless, that Christians shouldn't be afraid of death or anything up to death which would actually be a good thing for followers of Jesus as we're heaven-bound. So that's one thing. We're fearless. The second thing is that it means Christians can handle any criticism. You are held in the highest esteem. You are loved deeply and fully by the only person whose opinion really matters, God. Well-meant criticism or ill-meant criticism should not disturb our core confidence in who we are in God. We should be able to say to others, that who are trying to puff up our self-esteem or, or, or prick it, or those other things in life that we use to puff up our pride or, or other people use to prick it, and just say to those things, you are not my peace. God is my peace. My life is hidden in God. I know what God thinks of me, and he's very fond of me. The third thing is this, if we're drawing on this $10 million that's in the bank, we're going to be bold in prayer. God has told us to ask in prayer, and he'll give us whatever we ask for or something better. I mean, that's the basic idea of prayer. If we belong to Jesus and we ask for something in Jesus' name because he loves us and cares for us, he'll give us what we ask for or something better. So we are confident in God. So we ask in prayer. And the last thing is a Christian handles trials as a chance to grow in faith rather than seeing it as abandonment by God. Trials aren't punishment. And it's, it, all too often, we think it's exactly the opposite. Success means that God loves us. Failure means that God is mad at us. Because that's the way the human mind works, because we are self-righteous. Self-righteousness means if things are going right, I earned that. But if a follower of Jesus is... A follower of Jesus is able to go through trials without the guilt. I mean, trials are always going to be hard, but when guilt is added, they become close to unbearable. A Christian going through the same sort of trials is confused. 
They ask, why is this happening to me? What have I done to deserve this? And anytime we ask that, we can look at our lives and find something, right? Find, you know, maybe I did this or said that. Maybe it's karma. I shouldn't have hung out with those people. See, a follower of Jesus is the sort of person who's drawing on this $10 million. And so they're fearless, and they're bold in prayer, and they can take criticism, and they can endure trials. But if Satan can attack our conscience, then we're going to leave the $10 million alone. We won't live in God's love and forgiveness. Spurgeon was a, was a guy who wrote a whole bunch of devotionals. He was a great Christian writer a couple hundred years ago. And he was asked the question, listen, can, can a Christian lose their salvation? And he said, no, but think of it this way. If salvation is a boat headed up to heaven, you can't fall out of the boat. But what you can do is fall on the boat and break some bones and spend most of the trip in the infirmary. You're on the cruise, but you're not enjoying it. You've got $10 million in the bank, but you're not ever using it. The devil cannot touch the money in the bank. He, can, he can't touch the fact that you're forgiven, that you're accepted, that you're loved by God. He can't touch that. What he can do is lie to you and fool you into not using it. And the way he does that is through accusation. It's an attack on the conscience using either real or false standards of righteousness. My friend gave me an example of this. Um, <coughs> he knew an older gentleman who finally came to Christ after decades of really hard living. And the man experienced great joy in coming to faith and, and repenting. And that first night, for some reason, he remembered something that he had said 30 years ago when, in a bar under the influence of alcohol that was blasphemous. He said he didn't believe in Christ, and if, and, and if Christ existed, well, he could go to hell himself. He hadn't thought of that for 30 years. Hadn't even crossed his mind. And then all of a sudden, it's going through his mind like it's, it's on TV. And he ends up at the pastor's house at 3 in the morning asking, how could somebody who has said those things be accepted by God? And it's not only the things we've done, but your regrets can also be fiery darts. That we live with what we've done when we were proud or when we were stubborn, and we live with the results of those mistakes. <coughs> Sometimes it hits us. You know, I could have been this or I could have been that, could have done that if it wasn't for the mistakes I'd made years ago. And if you hear that voice, you don't need an exorcism. You need a defense attorney. See, there's a prosecutor saying to you in your head that says, if you were really forgiven, you wouldn't still be suffering from the mistakes you made when you took the wrong job, when you married the wrong person. This voice is often why we find ourselves down. We need a defense attorney with a Bible reminding us, listen, there is now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. If I'm still living with the result of a sin, it isn't punishment. It's an opportunity to grow. There are lots of examples of people who lived with their sin and, and grew in it in God. My, my example is always my namesake, King, King David with Bathsheba. God forgave him, and, and David grew. It wasn't easy. He didn't like the punishment that he received, but he learned how to live in that forgiveness. And that's for us too. I mean, if the, the effects of the previous sin are still in your life, they're meant to shape you. And they're meant to be part of your journey with God, doing what we need to do, leading us to people that we need to bless. The other thing is if you're regretting your sins, if you're thinking about them all the time, you're just pouring over them, then you aren't thinking about how God has blessed you in Christ and set you free. In a way, then you're still trapped by your past sins. Now, we do hopefully make progress in our sinfulness, sinning less over time. That's sanctification. But then a voice comes and says to, to you and to me, <coughs> really, you aren't any different than you used to be. You should give up. A real Christian wouldn't struggle with this, wouldn't, wouldn't do these kinds of things. And in response, we need to go back to Scripture. See, Satan sets up this standard of righteousness and then rubs our face in it, tries, us to, get to, tries to get us thinking about our sin more than our Savior. And God does convict us of our sin. The Spirit does, but He shows us, by, but He does it by showing us how much we're loved by God. And so 
the, the way the Holy Spirit convicts you of your sin when you're a Christian is, listen, God, God loved you so much, he, he went on the cross. So is it really okay for you to keep doing this or keep saying this or keep treating this person in that way? Satan says God will reject you, but the Holy Spirit never says that. The Holy Spirit reminds us that we are accepted. The accusation of the devil questions your acceptance, questions your grace, questions your status as a child of God. We reject that with the truth. A second kind of accusation is he takes a standard, perhaps from childhood or deep in your family, <coughs> that in order to be a good person, an accepted person, you have to live up to this standard. And I was thinking about this idea. Do you guys remember um, Forrest Gump a little bit? There, there was that, that captain um, and, and, um, in Vietnam, and you remember he talked about his history, that somebody in his history, um, uh, people in his family throughout history have died in all these different wars. You remember that scene? All these people just falling over. They were all him falling over in, in the Revolutionary War and the Civil War and whatever and, and dying. And so he, he thought, this is what I have to do in order to be a good person in my family. I, ca I came to Vietnam in order to be sacrificed because it's part of what my, my family does. It's a false standard. So maybe it is that you have to be wealthy or you have to be educated or you have to have perfect children or whatever that standard is, that I, that I need to see that, uh, to reach that in order to be successful. But then we have to go back to Scripture. There is now no condemnation. Christ has paid for all of our sins. And if our sins keep coming, we keep repenting. I mean, there's a reason that we confess our sins each week. It's because you need to. It's because I need to. We pray for God's strength to transform us, to be with us, to live lives that honor our friend and Savior Jesus. The answer to accusation is to point to Jesus. He's taking care of it all, no matter how loud the voice is in your head that says you aren't good enough. Jesus paid for it all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I don't know what everyone's struggling with here. I guess it's something similar to me that I've said things that I wish I hadn't said this week, and I've done things I wish I hadn't done. <coughs> I have not always treated people as though they were made in your image. And I'm sorry for that. And that's not who I want to be. So, Lord, I ask that you would hear our confessions, our individual ones, that you would offer us grace and forgiveness, remind us that you are our, our Father, that we are your beloved child, and that we are to live in grace and mercy. Lord, hear our prayers. So, Lord, for the things that we have, <coughs> pardon me, <clears throat> Lord, for the things that we have done this week that do not reflect your grace and your love, your forgiveness, but instead reflect pride and, and selfishness and unforgiveness, we are sorry. That's not who we want to be. Transform us to, more, to look more and more like who you are and the person you created us to be. Lord, we repent and ask that you would do the hard work of getting the truth put into the core of who we are instead of the lies. We thank you for the spirit that helps us do that. We thank you for your grace and your forgiveness always and ask that the spirit would continue to transform us to be more and more like you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The good news of the gospel is that we are forgiven and we are graced and God is good and he does forgive you. You are accepted. You are loved. You are God's kid no matter what you've done in the past. And that's good news. Amen? This week I was challenged and reminded to stop negative thoughts in their tracks and 
turn it around into a praise and lifting that praise to God. And that's what this song is all about, that we fight our battles by praising the Lord in times of trouble, in times of doubt, in times of fear, or just if those negative thoughts come into your mind, stop them in their tracks and turn it around, lift the Lord up, say a praise or two, and give glory to God. So let's stand. We're going to sing together, surrounded, how we fight our battles.
So big thanks to our, our visiting musicians today. Thank you very much. That was amazing. Um, let me bless us as we go out. Lord, send us out aware again uh, of your great love, um, how it overcomes anything that, that the voices are saying to us, that we are accepted beyond what we could ever imagine. Send us out with the Holy Spirit reminding us that. Send us out with the love of the Son. Send us out with the power of God the Father Almighty to take that message to the world. And the people of God say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank you.